take it. Um, so my name is Jal Bernsen. I, um, I uh, work at the Dolby Laboratories, uh, where I uh, till recently had a corporate development efforts. I recently took in a more operating role in our faster growing cinema business. But um, most of my background has really been on the banking side. I've uh, been on the corporate side for the last six, seven years, but I spent uh, about 15 years on the investment banking side as an M&A banker, Goldman Sachs and, and, and think equity uh, partners. And I've also served on a public board for the past 11 years where we have been doing a lot of M&A and restructuring uh, through some very volatile cycles in the, in the metals industry. So hopefully can bring a little bit of a, a versatile perspective on, on M&A. Good morning, I'm Fred Grafham. I uh, run investor relations and corporate development for a company called Digital Globe. Um, Probably what you would know about Digital Globe is we provide most of the foundational imagery for Apple Maps, Google, um, applications where mappers are, you know, have their information online. Before I came to Digital Globe, uh, I spent about 17 years with Comcast. Most of my background is actually operations, uh, either financial operations or I've been general manager of several business units. So uh, when I do m and I think of it from an operating perspective, less as a, as a banker, for example. Uh, I really think a lot about how we're going to integrate the business and ultimately drive value for the shareholders. Um, so, my name is Sid Tandon. I'm an associate partner with McKinsey in our Silicon Valley office. Uh, we've been with McKinsey for about six and a half years, uh, focused mostly on uh, transactions, primarily in high tech and uh, semiconductors. So, really excited to actually bring a lot of people have been doing a lot of research in this and have a lot of real time experience just sitting next to. Uh, colleagues such as you around uh, as you guys go through the thinking from conceptualization to execution and then full integration so happy to happy to share any thoughts thank you so <clears throat> what we're going to do today is we're going to hopefully bring to life how to make m a work for you in in corporate settings and we're going to do it based on our panelists experience and we're going to interplay that with some theoretical frameworks um, and what we'd like to have you be able to take away is sort of a pragmatic framework uh, to, to use and consider as you think about evaluating uh, future deals. Um, and then uh, we're going to zero in after that a little bit on the potential pitfalls that uh, may happen either in the strategy side or the implementation side. So let's dive in. One of the things that you know, we all have heard is that M&A as a growth strategy is uh, suspect, that 50% of uh, transactions fail. So uh, uh, at the same time, uh, if you do some reading, you will see that many consulting firms, including McKinsey, will tell you that serial acquirers return higher yields to their shareholders. So which is it? And uh, Maybe, uh, Jarl, I'll start with you uh, just to kind of uh, uh, approach that big picture question is, you know, are, are M is M&A acquisitions doomed from the start? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> I, I've struggled with, with, with those headlines for, for many, many years because, uh, <coughs> you know, people tend to read those headlines and you get the impression that doing <coughs> M&A is sort of a way of sort of playing the odds, but, it, it, you know, I think it's really a discipline like, like any other discipline. You, you either do it well or you, you do it poorly, and, and then of course then you fail. Um, but of course it's a, it's a very uh, specific capability, and it is, uh, if you don't have that capability, of course your risk increases dramatically. And the downside can be very significant when you do M&A, and I think that that's different. I don't see so many headlines about, you know, half, half of the marketing expenses are wasted, right? You know, but M&A sort of grabs the headlines, and I think that that's, that, that's, that's a mistake because you, you, it, it, it seeds that impression very often, particularly among companies that are not used to doing M&A, that it's just, it, it's a risky thing, it's something that you can't control, and you're really just playing the odds. So I... Um, uh, I very much disagree with those statements. I think you have to sort of go a little bit deeper and figure out what does it take to do to do uh, to do M and A the right way. So, Jarl, your point is experience is critical, and the more you do it, the lower the risk is is. Uh, you're, you're, uh, Absolutely, and I, I read an article office. not too long ago that actually came from McKinsey that 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 highlighted some of the stats that you mentioned that you know companies that that do a lot of M and A are serial acquirers, and I can't remember the exact number of transactions every year, but they tend to generate a lot of shareholder value, but in situations where 
you may only do one or two transactions a year. You really don't build that capability and the risk of failure is quite high. And so for me, the question becomes, because I think that's really the vast majority of the companies that, that do fewer transactions, may not have done it before, may be doing it for the first or second time. And so the question for those companies really are how can you minimize the risk of, of doing m and Like what do you need to put in place? What do you need to think about? How do you need to structure the company and the organization to really facilitate um, uh, a transaction and what you want to achieve with it? And, and Fred, I'll turn to you. Um, in, in view of wading in, what do you think about the importance of the size of the deal relative to the size of, uh, of, of the buyer? Well, it's interesting. I, I don't come from companies that were serial acquirers. Back to your original question, I think 100% of poorly planned and poorly executed M&A transactions fail. I mean, so I absolutely agree with you all on that point. Um, from the standpoint of size, most of the deals that I've been involved with, both as an integrator and as the M&A guy, uh, have been larger deals, transformative deals, deals that you would do only you know, every 12 to 18 months. I mean, like everybody else, we do bolt-ons, and there's a whole different set of uh, kind of rules for a bolt-on. You get into culture, and, and generally you're, you're doing something that's enabling a product or uh, enabling a capability or introducing yourself to a new customer set. But from the standpoint of size, I think it's really, really important to understand the integ integration implications of acquiring a company. For example, um, you know, I was with Comcast when we bought AT&T Broadband. <coughs> AT&T Broadband was twice as big as we were. And so the amount of, of integration work that was done both during the deal negotiations, just sort of thinking about how are we going to integrate this thing into uh, the broader organization, as well as post-announcement, uh, we spent a good deal of time during the regulatory process really thinking about how we were going to do this, how many people from the Comcast side of the of the of the fence were going to inter be introduced into the uh, into the acquired companies, and I think uh, because we did that level of groundwork and really thought about culture and structure and all those things early on, and then executed well upon them, including making sure that we achieved all the synergies we were looking for, both on the the re revenue and expense side. I, I think that greatly increased our likelihood of of success. Um, sort of the same thing with another deal we did at Digital Globe. We bought a mirror image of ourselves, uh, a company that was essentially about the same size as we were, did essentially the same thing we did. Uh, the market was downsizing and couldn't support two companies of that size, and we ended up with a, a large government contract that kind of ensured our, you know, that we would continue as a, as a viable entity. Anyway, we brought them in, and that was a that was a large deal for us uh, and a deal entirely based on synergies between the two companies. We had projected to the market that we would bring a, take about $100 million of run rate cost out of the business. We ended up taking about $120 million of run rate cost out of the business and um, that ended up being a successful deal. And, and again, through a, a significant level of planning, going back to your deal model and saying, what are we expecting to uh, achieve in this, uh, in this deal? And then and making sure that you had people executing on that plan and that you didn't sort of let the, the creep happen. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. You know, people leave and then somehow they show back up. We, we really were disciplined in our cost management and, and, and making sure that we got the, sh got the synergies we were looking for. And thanks, thanks Fred. Uh, Sid, is it, do deals f fail because of the wrong strategy or do they fail because of poor integration? Or is there, is there, one have more pitfalls than the other or it's everywhere? Yes, I think it's it's a couple of things, right? I mean, the thing that we've seen is the, this whole construct of 70%, 50% of deal fail or whatever is basically a fallacy because there's no, the, the time, by the time you see the success or not success of a deal or failure deal is multiple years into the transaction when the integration, the synergies and all that stuff starts kicking in, right? And so many times when you see these studies or constructs, that's why it sort of runs at odds with companies that do serial M&A actually do very well over a period of time versus companies that don't, right? And primarily the reason is because the effects just take time to basically flow through your uh, your strategy and your your PL, right? Uh, the um, the two things that we've seen, which are or three things we've seen, which are critical for success. One is the tie-in of the M&A teams, like having a thematic M&A program rather than an 
just a purely an opportunistic MA program, it's critical. That sort of ties into your your strategy, right? Whether it's it's consolidating an industry, whether it's driving for growth, whether it's adopt buying a disruptor, like whatever the strategy that you're putting in place, MA is basically a core part of it and the themes are built around that, right? That's so that's one. The second point is around proactive sourcing. So a lot of times basically sitting back VC companies that are outperformers actually go out and proactively source deal. They'll actually actively network. They will actually go to like venture capital conference and stream more from a high tech perspective, right? To see what's coming out there and what's out there rather than sitting back and getting the deal flow come to you, right? Which, which again separates all the winners from, uh, from the losers. And I think the last piece is the point that both uh, Fred and Yal mentioned is the integration, right? And if you, if you literally look at the integration post from the time you close the transaction, that's what determines the success of a transaction versus you essentially, whether you had the right theme in mind or strategy in mind or whatever, everything can work if you basically have the right integration mindset. And you have to, in the, pro, the issue also is people look at it, companies that don't do this often, they look at it as after, as post fact, they'll basically invest in integration capabilities. But the companies that are really good at it are companies that actually have uh, invested in systems and processes and, and people that are there to basically drive integration as a core capability. And that's basically the thing that separates, one of the key things that separates the people who really win long term versus not. So those are the three main things that we've seen. All right, so, so uh, as we get more specific around a strategy framework, uh, in preparing for this session, uh, I read some uh, articles uh, in in the uh, particularly on transaction advisors, it's a great great library of, of articles, uh, William. And uh, one article by Stephen Morris at U University of Chicago Booth School uh, really provides uh, a, an effort to understand where are the successful acquisitions and in what areas do they fall. And I'm going to describe it briefly and then ask the panel to kind of opine on some of these, these issues, because I think we'd like you to leave here with some idea of a structure, a decision structure, as you're thinking through uh, strategy questions. And Morris it says basically that you can think about acquisitions in terms of expansion of scope, expansion of scale, and expansion of capabilities or technology, those three. And each of them is very different, so scope is cross-selling new products to your existing customers, uh, cross-selling uh, existing products to new customers, vertical integration. Uh, there's basically uh, six or seven different ways of expanding the scope of the business um, uh, to accelerate market access or, or expand the product uh, scope. So that's scope. Scale is Let's take two companies very similar as you did with DG and put them together and take out a whole bunch of cost and get back end synergies because we're going to share some relatively fixed costs over a, a much higher revenue uh, uh, field. And, and that tends to be more cost centered, whereas the, uh, the scope tends to be more revenue focused. And then the last and very relevant for technology companies is getting new capabilities and, and R&D and I think that speaks for itself. So uh, maybe I'll just ask each of you to kind of think about and, and talk a little bit about where should companies focus? Should they focus, should they stay tight into where they're, uh, uh, you know, w where is it getting risky and where are the opportunities? Uh, and can companies, if they stay too narrow, are they actually expanding their opportunity set enough, et cetera? Where, how far do you go afield from the core? Yarl? Yeah, well, I mean, it's obviously a, a, a complicated question because a lot of that depends on the industry dynamics, you know, what, what's going on and what you need to do strategically to, to survive or, or succeed in your industry. And it may be that you have to do, as, as Fred mentioned, you know, transformational transactions and take a lot of risk in order to be a long-term survivor. There may be a, you know, technological shift in your industry, for example. But, but of course, the, the, the further you move away from your core business, the more risk you're gonna take. And of course, the more downside you're gonna have in your, your, your M&A situations. I think that um, at, at the end of the day, it comes down to 
certainly from my perspective, and they should be driving every transaction, what, what are you doing for, for with regards to shareholder value? Are you actually creating value from doing this? Whether it's getting into a new growth area, whether it is, is, is buying a similar business where you know, there's low hanging fruit and you can take the cost out. Um, not that every company is necessarily good at doing that, but I think that you gotta look at each situation individually and you gotta look at the, the return versus the risk and, and, and make a decision like that. But of course, uh, the, 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 the strategy of just going out and acquire interesting things because it may be a good opportunity and it has no relationship to your core business and your core capabilities, of course, is an extremely risky uh, proposition and uh, the landscape is glittered with, with, with massive failures in that area. And, and Fred, uh, you know, in your experience, I mean, talk a little bit about DG, what you do at your core, and, you know, some maybe one or two acquisitions that you did, like Radiant, that, yeah. you know, a, as to, you know, how do they fit into that framework of... Uh, yeah, so our, our, sort of our bread and butter business is the tasking of our satellites for both the U.S. government and international defense and intelligence uh, organizations across the world. Um, you know, probably a half a billion of our uh, revenue comes from that that business, that's core to what we do. We know how to fly, operate, uh, well, design, fly, uh, and ultimately sell imagery off the satellites. So that's, that's our core business. What's happened recently, and I'd say recently in the, next, in the last two years, is this whole idea of analysis and conflation of information has become very important to our industry, uh, that the, the, the value of a pixel is declining over time, and the value of the information is derived from both current imagery and historical imagery is, is increasing. So uh, the Radiant deal uh, is, is an interesting one for us. It was a small part of our business. It, it was about a $30 million piece of our business. This was a company that generated in, a, in excess of $100 million of, of uh, revenue. And it was, um, it was really doing things, it was kind of where the puck was going in the industry. So if you think about imagery is important, well, first of all, take, take a step back. What, what intelligence agencies are, are really good at mitigating threats in areas that they know about. The problem is that every once in a while in Oklahoma City happens and nobody was looking. And so, uh, so they're looking for solutions that take lots of data or take data and, and say, okay, there's something interesting going on over there and nobody's looking at it. And so this company, we bought a series of companies, but they're all under this company called the Radiant Group. These guys conflate data. So they take information, you know, tweets, you know, all the social media information, multiple sources of imagery, you know, cellular data, everything, and they conflate it. They, they put it into a big algorithm and then they say, okay, something really weird is happening there. And that's kind of where the industry is going. So I, I guess that's a scope play for us. Uh, it's, it's tangent or it's uh, adjacent to what we were currently doing. And, and, and actually from an integration perspective, this is an important point. We wanted to keep their DNA. We wanted to keep sort of the entrepreneurial aspect to that company, and so we we sort of reverse integrated. We moved our smaller business into their larger business and tried to keep their DNA. We keep them away from us, you know. So they're in DC. We're in we're in Denver, Colorado, and and that's not a small thing. And we kept most of their leadership because it's all about keeping sort of the the brains there. Um, I that that we haven't lost a beat. Uh, it's early, but we haven't lost a beat. The, the company's growing very nicely. Uh, and, and I think it was really important to send us the message to the people there that you know you're you're very valuable to where we're going as a company in the future, and uh, we're going to let you have your autonomy and let you to con continue to be entrepreneur entrepreneurial and creative. So, so that <clears throat> so it was a scope increase because you were selling an a, a an additional service to the same intelligence oh, agencies and, and, and additional three letter agencies, none right. of which I can talk about, but. And, and uh, but we can guess. And, and uh, but it was also a technology play, right? Yeah. Because you, you, you didn't have the capability in-house necessarily to do exactly that uh, big data an analysis. And, and if they didn't have a revenue stream, it would be, a, in my mind, it'd be a riskier transaction if they didn't have a highly, um, uh, it was a revenue stream we could diligence in a, in a meaningful way because of the nature of their contracts. I would say that the, you know, these plays typically are not cost takeouts, they're typically revenue plays. And so if we didn't have that, I think it would have been a much more risky transaction than what it, what it was. Um, and, and probably this one was a bit of an anomaly because normally you don't have that level of visibility into future revenue. 
big contracts, government agencies, a little, a little more uh, auditable, for lack of a better term. So when we think about this idea of scope, scale, and, and uh, capabilities, Sid, should the emphasis be on growing revenues, or should it be on cost takeout, or how do we think about, you know, where the more, you know, what's, what's the best focus area when you're thinking about an acquisition? So I think I'll go back to what Yal said, which is it sort of depends on what your overall corporate strategy is, and also it depends to some extent, and you're limited to some extent, by what your investor base is basically looking for you to do, particularly if you're a public company. Because if your investor base is looking for you to essentially drive cash flows, then you have to drive a certain set of transactions or types of transactions. If your investor base is looking for growth, which is a lot in high tech, for example, or in software, then you basically have a different set of transactions, right? Um, the, the interesting thing you can think of also is, um, you can think of it as a portfolio play. And if one of the things that we've seen over, um, over a long time is companies that basically have survived in the global 500, global 1000, essentially the, at their core, they are very good portfolio managers, right? And so one of the things that we've, we typically, companies tend to talk less about is the other side of M&A, which is the divestment, right? So if you think about, say, a 10-year or 20-year journey of a company, there's, especially in high tech and in semiconductors, very rarely will you find something that will just be there for 20 years. I mean, there's, it, stuff changes every three to five years and it becomes obsolete and or it goes from being different parts of the S-curve, right? And the question then basically becomes is as a management team, are you flexible and agile enough that you essentially can say, here's a portfolio of stuff that I have which sets me up well from, and is balanced to where my shareholder needs are versus where my um, strategy is. And, and against that, you basically then, there's puts and takes. So you basically will have, you may take steps around honestly looking at your portfolio and saying, am I the right natural owner of this asset or not? And that's usually a very tough conversation to have because it's like you build something from scratch or you bought something that made a lot of sense five years ago or seven years ago, and now it doesn't. And typically you'll see companies start becoming more bloated and slowing down because they don't do the, the divestment, don't look at the divestment side of the story, right? But companies that over a period of time that have been successful are companies that have transitioned and and look, still have the core capability, they'll still be the core software company and so on and so forth, but they've transitioned in such a way that the business that they started off in 20 years ago may only be 20% of the revenue now, right. or in three years from now versus being 70% of the revenue going forward, right? And that's a, that's a, in high tech and at least from what I've seen in semiconductors and software, the rate of stuff with the innovation happens, you can't, you can't have a 10 year, 20 year horizon. Okay. I just want to make a point. It's a, it's a great point you made. Um, the process of taking a look at what you currently have and evaluating it is very valuable. Um, frankly, we wouldn't have done Radiant had we not gone through that process because it was a small piece of our business. We were, you know, we weren't sure that it was really core to what we do and is it more of a distraction. And what we ultimately figured out is a very valuable part of our business. And not only do we want to maintain it, but we want to grow it. And we would, I don't think we would have done that. Uh, done the deal had we not had that strategic conversation first. So I think it's a great point you make. Uh, maybe I'd, I'd just add, add yes, that, um, you know, just like the, the headline about, you know, 50% failure rate in M&A, there's also this sort of very traditional notion that M&A is equivalent to cost synergies. And, and I very often come up against this, um, this perspective that, look, if we're doing M&A, it, it must be about cost synergies and we've got to take something out, even if there's nothing that we could sort of beneficially take out. And it may not create value to, you know, fire half the salespeople or do this or that and take that cost out. But there's just this inclination that for us to do a deal, you know, we must take certain amount of cost out. And I think it requires a lot more judgment than that and, 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 and pre-planning as we've been, been talking about here to really assess where's the value generated? Why are we doing this? You know, not, not cling on to these sort of headlines about M&A and what needs to happen here and there, I think, uh, I think it's become a lot more uh, nuanced uh, over, over the last couple of decades. Any uh, example at Dolby in terms of, uh, uh, you know, of a transaction that was maybe more revenue focused where there was not some obvious cost takeout? 
But yeah, yeah, well, I would uh, I'd rather stay at the hypothetical level. Okay, but, sure. But um, uh, you know, there was, there's definitely been situations where uh, there has been an urge from certain parts of a company to justify the transaction by taking some cost out, and and almost at a point where you take cost out just so you can show you've taken cost out, but it wasn't necessarily. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, beneficial for the ongoing business to do it. I think there, there is, I don't think that's a, uh, a rare situation at all. I, isn't that because cost takeout synergies are much easier to predict, much easier to forecast, and nobody's confident of revenue synergies? <laughs> I mean, I mean, Fred, comment on that, because I think uh, that was something that, that we well, talked about. Well, if I can make work. a deal model work with cost takeout, and it's not the silly cost takeout, it's not, you know, eliminating half your sales force or taking out people that maintain relationships that are very important to the future of the business. But if it's truly duplicative costs or administrative costs where you can you can take a you know take a decent amount out and justify the deal model, that that's that's a low risk deal. And and, and honestly we've done quite a few of those. And they're you know, you sleep a lot better at night after you sign all the documents because you know that, especially if you have an integration team that kind of gets it, which we do at, at Digital Globe and frankly at some of the other companies I've worked, very strong uh, folks that, that lead the, the operators through, you know, the, the process of integrating a company and, and what we're looking for in the deal model. So, yes, I, I absolutely agree that the, um, the risk of a deal, as long as you're fundamentally maintaining the business and the opportunities you're looking at for growth going forward, if, if you can justify a deal model through cost takeouts, that's, that's, that's a win. Now, fortunately, some of the deals we've done, we've been able to do both. We've been able to grow the revenue side and, and take costs. But, I, but it's, it's certainly harder to, to predict where the, because you're, you're dependent on things that have nothing to do with the deal a lot of times. Yeah, explain yeah. why revenue synergies are harder. Well, generally we minimize uh, how, you know, the disruption, first of all. So typically, um, even in the best run organizations, um, m and organization, you, you may take a step back on day one, and, and I don't ever see a deal model that shows the, the year one step mm, back, you know? So if your business goes backwards 5% in the first year, you know what, it may still be a good deal, but I bet you your deal model didn't show that. Um, on top of that, entering new markets uh, is a lot harder. We have, we talked a little bit about the buy versus build thing, and one of the, um, you know, it's hard enough to, to dovetail off of, uh, you know, a sales for what you do on a sales force that already exists with customers that already exist and you're just sort of introducing your brand and your products to them that's hard it's really hard um, in the buy versus build discussion you know then you're saying can we do it ourselves and build it from the ground up you always underestimate how hard that is it always takes twice as long and costs twice as much as what you thought um, but yeah I think I think you just underestimate um, how hard it is to build a business you know from soup to nuts and the good thing is the company you're looking at typically has already built a business. And so, um, you know, the, um, so I think, I think just underestimating the difficulty of integrating. So there's more organizational complexity. So yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, can I just say, yeah. I, you just don't know, right? You just know. You buy a company because you think that your sales force can throw another product on the, on the van and go and sell it to the existing customers. But you, at the end of the day, you don't really know if that customer will be interested in it buying that product, you don't know if they want to pay full price for it. So you don't know if you have sort of the synergies that you expected, right? The cost synergies are sort of just a really nice thing because you don't really have to, to do very much. You just cut it and that's done and now you justified the whole thing. And so the revenue thing is just so much more unpredictable. You can't control it. But of course you generate a lot more revenue or it's a lot more value from, from, from building revenue than just cutting costs. It's sort of a one-time thing and it's that benefit is not growing the way a, a revenue benefit will grow. And so I think it's really a matter of how, what can you control. And that's why I think a lot of people in M&A situations, you know, will very quickly sort of be lead to, well, maybe go a little bit overboard on the cost cutting and then be a little bit vague on, on, on the revenue synergies. Right. So you see there's a trap there. Um, yeah. Well, I'm going to eventually have to be real with them one way or other. I could just be real with them on day one or real with them on day 365, right? So the, the 
I mean, the answer is I have to set reasonable expectations and I have to paint the picture on why, you know, maybe year one we're, uh, you know, we're not going to see the growth that necessarily we expect in the long term because we're integrating. And, and you know what? They're smart. They get that. They've seen plenty, analysts and investors have seen plenty of deals and they understand that there's always some level of hiccup. And, and frankly, we've done a pretty good job of setting those expectations and then exceeding them. We haven't had as big a hiccup, um, you know, with these, with these businesses that we've acquired. Um, but it is my job, on, I, th that's the sad part, is I have to, I go do the deal, I get excited about it, but then I have to go resell it to the investors after I do it for <laughs> a public company. Dual heads, so, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I have to always have that in the back of my mind, and I do, I, I, I make sure that I understand why am I doing this uh, as I go through the process and how am I gonna talk to our investors about it. But yeah, it's my job to set expectations. If I do a poor job setting expectations, then shame on me for, I deserve the beating I'm gonna get in a year, so. So let's talk about ways that an organization can protect itself from groupthink and going down the rabbit hole on an acquisition that maybe is ill-advised. So one thing that you guys might engage in is uh, uh, buy versus build analysis. So how does that help? Do you do it? Is it you know is it is it helpful? Garl, start with you. Well, I think I think it's it, it can be a very good exercise. Um, just to get a sense of you know the magnitude of the resources that has gone into to something you're looking to buy and 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 and, and very typically you you will do this in connection with a sort of a, a smaller acquisition maybe it's a, a startup or it's something where you actually have the alternative to build it yourself you know you're not gonna you know suddenly create a billion dollar company in, 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 instead of buying it but but it's also, in, in, in my view, uh, can be a massive rat hole to go down. Because, it, first of all, most of the engineers that, that, that I have known, they will always feel that they can you know, build something that is much better than what you can acquire. So that's one thing. And so it always becomes a, 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 a real alternative. The problem is that um, your build plan will you know, require that you, know, you have you know, 10, 15 people sitting idle to actually build this thing, but your resources are committed to your existing strategic plan. You don't have those resources around, so what do you do? Well, assume you can go out and find the equi equivalent number of experts in this area, and let's say that takes 18 months to do. Well, I mean, by the time you've hired those people and got them in their seats, you know, the industry is now on the third generation of the product. So my point is, I don't think it's really a practical solution most of the time. It's it's. Um, it doesn't really it doesn't really work it's not a viable alternative uh, but it can create a lot of distortion in your decision process right because why go out and buy something when you can build something better for half the cost and as I, as I think you know Fred alluded to it always ends up also costing a lot more than what you think but you simply don't have those the resources are not available it's very often a theoretical exercise and so I think it's something that uh, that you have to be a little bit uh, cautious about and just quickly, uh, Fred, do you do the same? Do you do a we do a the analysis? Five versus we do the analysis. The engineers I deal with design <laughs> satellites, so they can they think they can do everything, and they're brilliant. But I absolutely agree with all the comments that were made. It takes uh, typically it's it it ends up very quickly going from a buy versus build to just do we want to do this? Do we want to buy? Forget the. The, the the build, but do we actually want to do this? It but just it's a takes too long. Yeah, yeah, it's a discipline. But it's a discipline you need to go through because every once in a while you're going to trip across something that you actually can do, and and you know you have the infrastructure to do it. I I wouldn't minimize the the mind share piece of it too. You just don't at least at Digital Globe and any other company I've worked for, we just don't have people sitting around look you know with available bandwidth to to do something new and, and increase their job scope, you know, fifty percent. It's just those people don't. Not in public companies, certainly. Yeah. So, and it, it's all, it's it also it depends on the disruption piece of it, right? And one of the things we've seen is, is just to build on Fred's point, is that the the build versus buy sort of works well if you're doing an incremental in your sort of swim lane analysis, right? The moment you basically start thinking about my swim lane is shrinking and there's something else in Addison that's shrinking that swim lane, or like my market's going to be disrupted by something else. That's where a lot of the bias comes in because like, it's very difficult for an organization that's built a $5 billion or $10 billion business over 20 years to suddenly stay, look itself in the mirror and say, oh, we, can't, like, we are going to get disrupted significantly and then go and actually take a uh, 
they will always keep arguing about, no, it's not going to be tomorrow, it's not going to be tomorrow. And I think from a management team's perspective, what we've seen is that people, the management teams that are very honest with the with that analysis about that our core is actually under threat from a significant disruption, that's when basically you sort of don't go through this, can we sort of gradually build our way into the market versus do we use our current cash flows and our current scale and everything else to make a transformative transaction that basically makes us a leader in that space. So rather than somebody cannibalizing us over a period of 10, five or 10 years, we basically, we essentially bring that in-house and then we basically control both sides of the equation and we use this cash to basically drive the other side. I think that's, it's in, in particularly in the fast moving tech space and software and all that stuff, it happens all the time, right? And I think this this being honest with yourself about the the disruption that you may not see everything, right? I mean, that's the other point is everybody thinks that we know everything going on in a space, but the whole beauty, the reason Silicon Valley exists is because two guys in a garage can basically disrupt you, right? And so that's basically the construct that you need to be aware of and, and um, be able to come to terms with very openly, so. And then Sid, you mentioned earlier another uh, way of sort of monitoring, self-monitoring a company, which is, are we the natural buyer? Are we the logical buyer? Uh, is that a valuable tool? Is it important that you are the most logical buyer? Um, you know, <coughs> but there is something to that. And so, I mean, let's just explore that for a minute. Yeah, I mean, the natural owner of an asset is, is interesting because you sort of have to look at it from a perspective of, um, is, you may not, so like, do your customer are the customers that you're selling to, and essentially, are they essentially looking for this technology or this product that essentially you can then, uh, and they would look traditionally to you to offer it, right? Um, like, just saying that basically a company X is my customer doesn't mean anything. Like, one of the things that we obviously many times see is the buyer inside a business can be very different. So you can say my, my, uh, a large Fortune 500 company is my customer if I'm an enterprise tech provider. But in one case, you could be selling to the VP of uh, the VP of IT infrastructure, and the other case, you would be selling to the apps guy. And like those things don't necessarily just meld together as seamlessly as you would think they would, right? And so just saying X is my customer, and hence I'm the natural owner of this asset, doesn't really work, right? I think you need to do it, uh, but at the same point in time, it, you know, there's no need to over-index on it, particularly when you're going through a disruptive uh, phase, right? So if you if you are selling into an industry and you're getting disrupted by somebody else, the perception is you're a legacy old company. Why would you be like? Why would you be the right owner for this vibrant, fast-growing uh, entity? And at that point in time, I think that analysis uh, is uh, you sort of have to give it due credit, but at the same point in time, the strategic intent of moving into that space to to what I was talking about earlier in terms of covering your own disruption overrides it, right? right. So, And Fred or, or Jarl, do you guys do that in-house in as well? Say, are we the natural buyer? Are we the logical buyer? Either of you? Uh... Yeah, I don't I don't think we, uh, you know, we're, we're conservative by nature and I don't, we tend not to sort of, we're into very new areas. So I think most of the time we are sort of naturally one of the best buyers or something. Yeah. We're better at it than what we were. Um, I, th I think we've, that's partially because we've solidified our strategy as a company in a, in a much more um, robust fashion than, than maybe historically we had. And so if you don't fit into our strategy, we really question whether we're the logical buyer for, for it. I, and I have companies that come in all the time and you know with pitch, pitch books and talk to us about things. And I'm thinking to myself, why in the world aren't you talking to so-and-so? And, uh, and so, I don't know that it ever gets to the board level. At that. We've done that work really early in the really? process because, yeah. again, we're small. We have limited resources. I can't waste time on things that aren't consistent with our strategy. And then we're going to talk about integration, and we have a few more minutes here. Uh, but I want to – is integration discussion part of the decision whether we should proceed or not? Uh, do you guys have a view on that? In other words, do you do some pre-merger integration discussion as to can we implement this, how would we implement this? Absolutely. I think um, uh, I've certainly been in situations where uh, an assessment, my assessment certainly been, you know, we don't have the capability to, in capability to integrate something. 
And a, a proposal may have been that we're going to leave them separate and run their own business. It may be sort of adjacent to our own business, and it's not something we necessarily have to integrate unless we're just absolutely dying to get those cost synergies I talked about before. Um, but if we decide that we have to integrate them, there are situations where uh, you know we would absolutely decide that we can't do it because you can predict that it's going to be a meltdown, and we don't have the capacity to it. Maybe at that time or, or ever, maybe it's just too complicated for us, and uh, we know what the consequences might be, and so we we would back away from a situation like that. Okay. And Sid, maybe some thoughts on the importance of thinking through integration before you actually pull the. Yeah, and I think it's it's absolutely. I mean, we've seen it's absolutely crucial, right? I mean, there's some uh, uh, some of the clients I serve basically they spend a lot of time upfront thinking to the integration, like all aspects of it, right? It's not just, and you, you would, and you would triangulate. So you would actually go out and, and test it with your customers, right? Like, like with your sales force and whether the integration is going to work or not. You start thinking about the culture, right? Whether that's going to meld or not. You're going to start thinking about systems, right? As much as you can, you can see outside in because a lot of the stuff also, especially in bigger transactions, it relies on essentially bringing the the systems and the technology together seamlessly. And that's, again, something that you can't fully plan going in, and obviously there'll always be surprises on the other side of the curtain, but the more time that basically we see uh, people spend upfront is, with obviously the limited information that you have before going into a transaction is significant. But I think the other point is also the moment, as you get closer to a transaction, once you've announced, like, once you announce a transaction, there's typically a significant, especially in big transactions, there's typically a significant lag time between announcement to close. And there's given, given obviously within the legal parameters of what you can and cannot do, that's really a time to like double down on integration planning, like really deeply. And like really put your best people at it, start thinking about it holistically, put in place the systems and processes to do it. And the, mo the more you do that then, so the day when day one comes, you're ready to go, as much as you can be ready to go. And I think that's the, the time frame that I would look at is, is there some work you can do upfront which sort of gives you a sense of whether this is gonna work or not and how difficult is it gonna be. And that's typically not the gating criteria to whether or not you do a transaction, that's like what you need to do to de-risk the transaction. And then the second, when the moment you announce the transaction, then you double down on the de-risking and the integration planning of it and so that the execution on day one, you run it, you hit the ground running, essentially. And how do you guys, you know, t I turn to Ural and Fred, how do you guys organize the integration process internally? Because, you know, just thinking through, yeah. you know, is it a separate team or how do you develop continuity? We, and I think we may be different in this regard, but um, <laughs> at Digital Globe, uh, we, t we typically, and by the way, to answer your question, it better be part of your pre, uh, or your pre, uh, before you make the decision actually about it, you better be thinking about integration. But we have a separate group uh, in our company, small group, but uh, someone who has a lot of experience in integrating companies. And you know, the way we do it is we have the small group direct the operating heads to, uh, you know, to sort of think about how they're gonna do it in the most efficient uh, and effective manner. Uh, so we have a separate group. Uh, we typically bring that team in before we sign anything, but uh, you know, maybe uh, you know, a couple weeks before we're ready to sign documents, uh, we'll bring them in and just get, you know, look for any red flags or concerns that we haven't thought about. Um, and um, and then they kind of take the ball from there, and and they're so good at it that it's it's actually a luxury for me. I don't have to spend a lot of time in integration planning because they do such a good job of it. But Jarl, you know, I, I think you would say that there's a concern about continuity from deal strategy and planning to implementation, <laughs> and how do you develop that continuity? Yeah, so so we don't have a uh, we don't do enough to have a a sort of a team on standby to do integration. And so when we do something, we, uh, we basically assemble the team, a cross-functional team uh, for that transaction. But of course, we need to lead and drive that and, and make sure everybody's coordinated. But I think it's, um, it's extremely important that there is that continuity you know, from the beginning of the due diligence process all the way through integration. Because it's just amazing how much you learn through due diligence that can have an impact on integration which I think in many situations, many companies, you do it a little bit differently where you know, the deal team throws it over the wall when to the integration team and they run with it. There's a lot of information that gets lost. And um, you know, whether it relates to you know, operational issues or defect products or you know, litigation or 
certain customer issues and problems that should be addressed right away, um, that can very easily sort of be, 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 be dropped. Uh, so having that continuity uh, from the deal team into the integration team and even have an overlap, I think is extremely important. Now, is it best when you're doing implementation to do it fast, rip off the Band-Aid, and just kind of make it happen? Uh, or should this be done gradually? Or how do you guys think about customizing it to the situation and the scenario? And maybe, Sid, yeah. start with you and then go to the, to the corporate guys. Yes, I think it, it, it um, the answer sort of depends on some function, like the GNA functions, for example. You may want to go faster um, because a lot of your reporting your internal systems and so on and so forth dip, uh, depend on that, right? And that's a, sort of the first place you can achieve your cost synergy the fastest, right? The places, the more you start getting into engineering, um, R&D, for example, or uh, sales and marketing, you have other factors that start playing into consideration, like your product roadmap is already ongoing on both sides. It takes time for those things to merge over a period of time. So you can't just rip the bandit <laughs> off, right? On customers, there's existing cu account relationships that exist and how you bring them together can have a material impact on your revenue trajectory. I mean, whether you rebound from that first year blip or not kind of depends on that, right? And um, the and the, the last piece I think is, is, is it, but at some stage we've seen that typically over a couple of years, right, two to three year time frame is when sort of everything converges and you now are operating as a integrated entity and different functions just take different time frames to basically come together over a period of time. And, and do you I, guys have ideas on how yeah, fast I, you should I, go? I break the world into things you do to play and things you do to win. I think the things you do to play, you know, pay your people, pay your bills, you know, do all the, you know, the sort of my job stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, that stuff I think you should move as quick as possible. Uh, typically has less impact on, on the, end, the end customer. I think the things you do to win, serving your customers, product development, all that kind of stuff, you really, you can screw up on the first one a little bit and get away with it on, on the latter. It's, it, you yeah. really need to be thoughtful and make sure you're not impacting your customers. That's the first thing they're looking for. They're looking for, you know, what does this mean to me? You know, this new organization, has it gotten out ahead of its skis and now it's, you know, it's not delivering the way it used to deliver. And so I think you just need to be more thoughtful, which probably means a little bit slower. Yeah, I just say it's, it's really a judgment call. I mean, uh, things like, you know, customers, how to deal with customers, who is calling, which customer and all of that, that has to be ready on day one, it's absolutely critical. And then there are probably a lot of things in sort of on the back end and operations that not, doesn't necessarily have to happen day one. And so I think applying that judgment across the board is, is very important. But one thing I've seen very often is that companies go down a path where they think that I can stage it maybe over three years and I'll just have these people finish this and after two years I'm gonna fire them. That doesn't work yeah. in, 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 in real life. I mean, you just can't. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a notion that I've seen repeatedly, right? And so I think that there you have to be a lot more decisive and say, look, you know, this is what I, is critical for day one. And the rest of it, uh, knowing what my plan is, I gotta do it sooner rather than later. And it, would it be fair to say that if you think, go back to our uh, strategy framework, that where you're talking about scope extensions and even far reaches of scope extensions that you're probably gonna integrate slower, whereas if it's a scale, mm -hmm. if it's uh, more back end weighted, more cost synergy, you're gonna go faster. Is that a fair, a fair yeah. assessment? I think you assess, you assess what are the resources I need to execute the plan I put in place. Why am I doing this transaction? What is it I'm going to achieve over the next one, two, three years? And what is required for that? And whatever is not required, of course, you should you should take out, but it also come back, comes back to what, what, what Fred talked about, what the expectations you're setting with your board and you're setting with the street, et cetera, right? So I think you just have to be very measured about how you do it, make sure that you can deliver what you promise. The, the other thing is also on the river, the construct is, that's pretty well common now in the value is the reverse integration construct, right? Which is, is reverse integration. So you buy an entity, you essentially are, it's in a new space that either you're not in, and going back to your point around scope, right? It's you actually may not integrate as much as, as you would normally do in a typical transaction. And the reason is basically they are your core to going building the stuff going forward. And depending on, um, depending on where you are with your own systems and your own product roadmap and everything else, the extreme version of that is essentially you reverse integrate into them. Because if they basically have bleeding edge systems, they basically have, um, they build, build it from the ground up, right? So like they, they use all, 
uh, next generation uh, processes and so on and so forth, you might say, look, the integration doesn't work the other way around where you just say, you just reverse, flip it around to the other side. So I think that's the uh, other angle also is that you have a reverse integration construct that you can keep in mind in certain situations. Right? Yeah, that's interesting. How so important- So the other thing I just mentioned, which I think is actually quite important because it's, it's very underrated, that is, the, the use of divestitures is something that's 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 very ignored in the corporate world because it's a capability that doesn't exist in most companies. But if you can actually, you know, you can use that and generate a lot of value from that. I think in many situations where you get something, something is just not core, and if you can just immediately start carving that out and prep for that and divest it, I think you can uh, you can save yourselves a lot of problem because very often that becomes something that's lingering for years. Look, what I'm going to do with this? It's you know not really paying attention to it. And, and, and I think that you can proactively uh, generate a lot of value by more, more use of divestitures, but of course that's where you, you need a little bit of help like, like an advisor, right? But um, I think that's something that's neglected way too often. And then how important is culture in, in uh, implementing uh, an integration? Um, you know, in, in terms of retaining talent, et cetera, what, and, and how do you deal with cultural and what, what does this mean, you know, what are we talking about when we're talking about culture? I mean, culture, I mean, if you look at the transactions that essentially fail, right, I mean, that's probably one of the top reasons why the transactions fail over a period of time, right? It's just because the cultures didn't come together very well. You were not able to retain the best engineers. You basically had a misalignment of um, what, uh, how you plan to run the company from a strategic perspective and the interpretation of the strategy was different from what was laid out. So I think the, the cultural aspect is, is super important and particularly, um, particularly in a situation where you're actually buying fast growth, innovative companies into larger organizations, it is, that is like the death knell if you don't figure that part out, right? And very, you essentially need a, a very astute view of, okay, I'm either gonna, bring these guys inside and and create, protect them from the stuff around. Like there's been uh, transactions where basically big companies have bought emerging startups and just allowed them to bloom right under their umbrella without actually like, uh, uh, without actually imposing their own systems and processes and everything else on them, right? And uh, the same thing also is true if, if you're, um, and in extreme situations, you can actually generate a lot of value out of it, right? Like there's been instances where in tech, People have bought companies, they basically have allowed them to nurture from, let's say, 400 million revenue to say a billion or two billion revenue. And then you basically, at some point, you're like, this is big enough, we can actually spin it out and and run it as, and you can create so much value. I mean, the EMC VMware transaction is one of the most value generating transactions in history, right, in tech. And that was part of that kind of a construct, right? And so I think the culture of, and. VMware is still here, EMC was always in Boston, right? And this, that culture is, is super critical and understanding that and going into it is quite important. So isn't this, it's almost a structural problem uh, going into it because if you have a, a large buyer and a relatively small target, the small target, the and it's entrepreneurs, they make decisions on the fly. It's a very small group of uh, decision makers. Mm -hmm. uh, a large corporate has to have a decision, uh, a hierarchy, and decisions are slower, and everything needs to be cleared at the top, and so things become more bureaucratic. How do you keep the entrepreneur, how do you retain the yeah. entrepreneur? Yeah. I mean, Fred? Yeah, I, you know, it's, culture is so important that you actually will structure your company to accommodate it if it's a culture you want to maintain, right? So <laughs> I use the example of Radiant. We, we, we left that business essentially alone. We kept most of the leadership. Um, you know, back at Comcast, you know, we bought QVC, left all the, the leadership in QVC, put incentives and, and then over time we integrated certain portions, again, mostly back office stuff, but for the most part we left the culture alone. So I think in your example where you're buying a highly entrepreneurial, quick decision making company and you're a larger public company, you're just going to have to get smart about how you, you, you figure out how you give them enough you know, of the field where they can make good decisions and drive the business forward and still maintain your corporate governance in a way that, you know, you have to as a, as a public company. And, it, you know, that's where the pre, you know, signing everything diligence comes in. It's just as important as checking pipeline and, you know, all the environmental issues. That is just as important as part of diligence, I believe. Because you see, you know, you see a lot of, uh, you, know, you know, the history is littered with 
entrepreneurs leaving yeah. you know, within a month or two of, of an acquisition. Uh, you know, Apple's acquisition of Siri, for example, you know, and pretty soon that team is out building their next AI uh, platform, which they then just sold to Samsung, and how, will, how long will <laughs> Samsung keep that team? I mean, these are, you know, and, and yet without the team, what do you, you know, you're buying a static technology. So one of the things I've seen is the management team of the acquirer actually spending a significant amount of one-on-one -on -one time with the with the founders of the small uh, over the duration of both the obviously during the deal negotiation is slightly more difficult but like post signing and before closing you can spend a significant amount of time just understanding between the two uh, between the two sets of groups right because it is really important for the ceo and the and the management team to get a real handle on basically like okay how do these guys really think how do they operate and that you can only get by FaceTime. So uh, I'm, we're going to finish up with just a short discussion on how do you know if it worked. Do you guys do any post-merger review of, uh, of success? Is there a measure of success? Jarl? Yeah, no, absolutely. In, uh, in our case, I mean, it, it, it's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis because the rationale will be different. I think that that's, that's the way to do it. But it can be everything from, you know, retaining or gaining market share to retaining employees to, you know, development and getting a product to market. I mean, it, it, all, it all depends on, on the situation. But we definitely, uh, we definitely keep track of that and, 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 and measure it and try to, we try to get more sophisticated also about measuring the financial return, which can be a little bit difficult once you start you know, blending things together and, and, and it gets harder to, to, to measure. But uh, we do want to keep uh, close track of, um, of uh, you know, how we perform in these situations. And, and Fred, what's your, yeah, what do you our, do? Our board requires it. So the internal audit group looks at every deal we do and, and reports out to the board. We typically set on essentially day one, we set five or six metrics that are key metrics for success and we're held accountable to them. Yeah, and hopefully metrics that you can measure yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's and, and contemplating things like we're going to integrate this into our cost structure, so it's not going to be as, so it may just be we're going to look at the top line, or we're going to, you know, but yeah, it, it's things that ultimately I have to sign off that I'm going to be held accountable for. Yeah, I agree. And management teams are all, I mean, most of the clients we sort of have clear KPIs and, and, and to account for the integration and success of these things, and they're tracked pretty closely, so. So we'd love to uh, answer any questions from uh, the group here. So feel free to just raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll please, uh, Tom. Yep. So Tom was asking, uh, how do you prioritize the deal pipeline, given that you're probably looking at hundreds of deals a year. Yeah, I mean, I think in our case, it's a very, very uh, fluid process. You know, we, there's, there's a constant deal flow, and, and sometimes it's actually quite overwhelming. But I think we have a very good understanding of, in, 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 in our group, you know, what, what might be of interest and what, what, what is not of interest. But we actually vet a very large number of transactions. And it really comes down to, is there a, is there a good strategic rationale and is there someone who would be interested in sponsoring this <coughs> right and in 99 out of 100 times the answer is no right but we do uh, we do as long as it's somewhat close to our business we look at it quite carefully and so it's just an ongoing process I mean we constantly have you know I don't know you know probably between 10 and 20 situations going at the same time that that, that, that we're just keeping in the air and making sure we we analyze and get input in it. Then if it goes to sort of a little bit the next stage, so to speak, and that's not terribly formal, you know, we may start doing, uh, you know, some deeper analysis on it, may start engaging a little bit just to uh, to get a better sense whether this would, would fit with us. We have a two-prong approach. We have a company full of hunters, so we're, we're always putting it out there in our corporate communications. I speak to the company quite a bit on the IR side, so we're, we always, Say there's no bad ideas. You know, if you guys have an idea about a company that you think might be interesting, send it to me. Uh, we also have a formal process. We do executive leadership meetings offsite, generally once a quarter. Uh, typically, an hour and a half of that is an M&A discussion where leaders are bringing ideas in, or we're bringing. You know, hey, these are the 
the top 20 targets we're thinking about right now. What are your thoughts? And um, you know, if one piques the interest of the team, typically you get an executive sponsor and you start looking at it in, in earnest. But uh, so we have, I, I actually believe the former is in some ways more valuable. I'd rather have it come real time as long as the whole organization is thinking about it. Um, it's, it can be very effective. Um, if, you, if you don't have a culture of M&A or you haven't created one or people just think I'm wasting my time by even saying anything, then it's not as effective. We, we've been pretty good over the last couple of years. We've, most of the deals we've done have come as a result of that, not as not some formal review every quarter. And, and we browse landscapes all the time. Yeah. And we, we have certain areas that we know we, we, we should be looking at and we, we look at any target we can, we can find. Yeah. Right, right, to Sid's point, which is you're not sitting back waiting for things to yeah. come across your desk right. from the yeah. investment I, bankers. I think we're more, we're more likely to buy something that we identify than something that just happens to be wrong. <laughs> yeah, um, it's sort of a little bit more, uh, you know, finding that sponsor. You know, a business group head. If a business group head says this is something that 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 I could use for my strategy and and and, and I can do something with that, then it goes further. You know, it doesn't it doesn't go up and then come down to the to the business group head. So, it's something that's sort of built from the ground up. And, uh, and uh, normally, by the time it gets to the very senior level, uh, you know, a fair amount of, you know, um, conviction has been built into it. Please, Brian. It's a good question, and we, we, we didn't talk much about valuation, but obviously it, it's always central to every, uh, every transaction. Yeah, the first question is, is it consistent with your strategy? Does it, you know, can you integrate it, can you? But, I mean, it's, you know, what point it's probably running contemporaneous with a lot of the other stuff, starting to develop valuation, things of that nature. Sometimes you're right, you don't have a lot of time to think about it, so you have to make a, you know, you have to do those other evaluations pretty quickly. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say it's before or after anything kind of runs, you know, at the same time. Um, but we do know when we're saying, okay, this is, you know, it's either not strategic or, you know what, we just know the valuation is going to be beyond what we're willing to stomach. And um, again, being a public company, we're going to be held accountable pretty quickly for what we pay for these things, especially being a smaller public company. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's, it's earlier in the process, especially if we think it's a red flag that you know we're just not going to be able to afford to do it. Yeah, we don't. We don't. Valuation is not such a big issue right in the beginning, but it's something that we look at because from the beginning, I need to have a a a, a, a view on it, right? Whether it's just a loose guess on the estimate or you know whatever it is, right? But it's not a it's not a a, a, a hurdle. You know, the strategic fit is really the first thing, and then we figure out what the valuation is, and we tend to we we can actually get quite creative on. On structuring, you know, you know, deals that 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 sort of bridges gaps and things like that. We we we've done some creative earnout structures and things like that. So so valuation is something that we feel that if we really want it from a strategic perspective, you know, valuation is something that we can uh, we can get comfortable with. But we're very very fundamentally oriented. I mean, you know, taken some flack for this over the years, but you know, my standard thing is the DCF over a ten year period with excruciating detail, just so you can understand. What is it that you have to believe about the industry and the company in order to justify what you're doing? But I think that that is uh, the most educational process you can go through on, from a valuation perspective. What you end up doing at the very at the end of the day, that's that sort of is is, is sometimes a, a different different issue. Yeah, and I would say you know at Lazard in terms of our sell side processes, strategic fit uh, is so much more important because that's that's a, a binary yes or no, and there's going to be a market clearing price and. And uh, usually there's two or maybe three strategics <laughs> circling this asset. It's not a uh, huge universe, and they can typically overpay uh, relative to a financial buyer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if the fit is there and the models work, uh, obviously you're not going to pay more than the DCF uh, uh, with, with uh, you know, reasonable assumptions. But uh, any other uh, thoughts or questions? And if anybody has, you know, a comment or an editorial, uh, uh, you're, you feel free to chime in as well.
Please. Earn, do earnouts really work? I, I say most of the time, no. I think it's something that, you know, everybody hates them. And, but you sometimes gets to the point where uh, it's really the only way to get something done. And uh, I think the sort of tr traditional earnouts where it's, you know, it's an EBITDA measure and, you know, if you hit it, you get paid. If you <coughs> don't, you, you don't. I think it, the, the key is simplicity, you know. Is it something that you can clearly measure and something that you are completely unlikely to litigate over, right? And if you can create something, a metric that everybody agrees that, look, if you hit this metric, you get paid and we're really happy because the business has been a success. And it may be as simple as, you know what, we, we, we ship X number of units and we, we know kind of what the cash flow value of each unit is in our model you know, let's, we, can, we, can, we can figure something like that out. And that, that works for both parties. So I think the answer to the question is, look, you know, 99% of the time, no, it doesn't work, it's terrible. And I, I've always also heard that most buyers, you know, when they enter an earn out, they don't really expect to pay it. Because it's pretty easy to, to, uh, to create a scenario where you don't pay it, as you know. But if it's something that you can't really manipulate on either side, I think uh, you can structure something that works. And, if you're in a situation where you actually have to bridge a gap, and it could be something simple as, you know, I think the industry is going to do this, but 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 they think the industry is going to do that. You know, what's the value of that gap? And 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 if 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 if, if I'm wrong about the industry, more than happy to to, to pay. So um, so it's in, in specific situations like that you can, you can you can structure it, and 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 we have not been afraid of going down that path and trying to figure out something that is fair for everybody and very, very transparent. That can work. The rest of it, no, I, I would never touch it. Thank you for your honor. Yeah. Well, thank you all, thank and uh, we appreciate it.